Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction House taking a look at some of the guns that they are going to be selling in their upcoming December of 2017 premiere auction, and we have quite the unusual contraption here to take a look at today. This is a Cameron Yagi trench rifle, and the purpose of this is to be able to fire accurately from over a trench parapet without exposing one's own head to enemy fire. This is a sort of contraption that was actually fairly popular during World War I, uh, having been developed probably originally by the Australians in 1915, and subsequently or independently copied by basically every country that was in combat. This is kind of a self-evident sort of contraption to try and make if you're sitting in a trench and uh, every time any, any person exposes any sort of body part over the trench parapet it attracts bullets. Well, you very quickly decide to try and come up with a way to fire back without actually potentially taking a bullet yourself. So um, this is one of the more elaborate and more, well, better constructed examples that I've seen. The two guys who were responsible for this uh, were both from Cleveland, Ohio, uh, two guys named James Cameron and Lawrence Yagi. Yagi was actually a pretty serious rifleman himself and he experimented with a number of other rifle improvements during World War I. Most interestingly, he actually made uh, Bakelite front sights out of red and green Bakelite, attempting to come up with a colored front sight that would present uh, a better distinguishing background uh, on hard-to-see targets. So really uh, envisioning the sort of thing we have today in colored fiber optic front sights on pistols mostly. But uh, he experimented with that fully understanding the problems of trying to shoot at a difficult to see target through combat conditions. Anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about today, we're looking at the trench rifle. Um, he and Cameron put together this system on a couple of basic premises. Uh, the US Ordnance Department was not interested in a system like this that would require substantial modification to the 1903 rifle that it was using. So. Cameron and Yagi came up with a system that requires basically no permanent modification of the guns, which is kind of impressive. It's also a very stable system. A lot of these are kind of flimsy, rickety wood and wire contraptions, and this one is not only, not only does it leave the rifle un, unmolested, so to speak, it's quite stout, and it has a really slick system for operating the bolt. That's the other thing that you often don't see on trench rifle setups like this. They'll have some sort of remote connection to the trigger so that you can fire without exposing yourself above the trench. However, you then have to bring the whole contraption down to cycle the bolt. This not only allows you to cycle the bolt, but allows you to do it actually really smoothly and easily, which is pretty impressive. Now this was formally submitted to the US Ordnance Department in September of 1917. They came back requesting a number of small changes, mostly they wanted to, to reduce the weight of the system. Uh, in total, ultimately about 12 of these were made. They were never formally adopted and they were never put into mass production. This was just, you know, by 1918 this wasn't really quite as important as it had been in the earlier years of the war when the, the trench warfare stalemate was was really the, the main problem. Uh, by 1918, things like trench raiding tactics um, and more modern light infantry tactics had been developed, and, and that was a, a better way to try and, uh, well, fight the war than by just taking pot shots with weird periscope rifles. So uh, these actually went into storage after the war, and like so much other war material in the mid-1920s, I think 1925 specifically with these, the Ordnance Department decided to divest itself of some of this old stored up ordnance, and uh, the surviving examples, or the, the examples in storage at that point, were all supposed to be destroyed. Uh, this one survived. I don't know if honestly any others have survived, so it's really cool to get to take a look at this one. Now none of them, none of these prototypes were exactly the same, but they all have pretty much the same basic principles. So let's take a closer look at this. I want to show you how that bolt system works. So this seems really complex at first, but it's actually a lot simpler than you might expect. Uh, first off, we have the rifle up here, and the rifle is held onto this device by two mounting brackets right here. Uh, this one is just a, a clamp that tightens down. You can unscrew that like so, although we'll leave it connected for the time being. And then we have a metal butt plate and a rest here, and a strap 
holding the, the back end of the stock all firmly in place. There is a bolt handle right here, and this is connected to a couple of segmented arms. And so if I lift the bolt handle up like that, I have now recocked the rifle, and then this whole triangular assembly runs on this rail right here. And that allows me to slide the bolt back, and then slide it forward, and then pulling this down pulls this whole assembly down and closes the bolt. The actual connection here to the rifle bolt is another clever system. Instead of trying to cut off the bolt and mechanically connect it with pins or something like that, what they've actually done is just have a thumb tightened, in fact I can just open this up all the way right here, this bolt connection right here simply is a thumb tightening screw with a little spring-loaded detent to prevent it from rotating uh, when you don't want it to, and it clamps the bolt handle in between this rounded surface and a round detent on this side. Because of the two concave surfaces that the bolt handle sits in, uh, as long as this is tightened down the bolt can't get out, but it's also not held so tightly that it can't move, and the result is uh, the bolt or the bolt handle ball is able to pivot in this mounting and thus easily and smoothly cycle up and down. Just like that. The trigger mechanism is also really quite simple with just a series of lever arms. There's a pivot here, a pivot here, a pivot there, and a pivot there. And pulling the trigger back pushes this forward, that pivots on this point which pulls this backward, and fires the rifle. It actually has a much better trigger pull than you would imagine. A little bit of uh, take up down here when you're getting ready, but after that uh, these are pretty stout solid bars and they don't really flex, so once you have the take up out of the system you get the same trigger pull that the rifle does by itself. Down here where the shooter would actually be handling this thing, uh, we have this kind of weird multi-curve setup of this iron bracket. This part is of course coated with leather because this is the shoulder rest for the shooter. Uh, you would have your presumably right hand out here on the trigger, and you'd operate the trigger and the bolt handle with the same hand. So uh, you fire the gun and then take your hand off the trigger to cycle the bolt. Now if you're able to cycle the bolt nice and smoothly, as the Cameron Yagi allows you to do, uh, you're going to want to be able to shoot as much as possible with the rifle in a good position up on the parapet before you have to bring it down to reload. So for that reason they added one of the 25 round extended magazines to the rifle. So instead of having five shots you have 25 shots before you have to reload it. Now one last element here of course, you can have a lot of rounds and you can have a nice smooth bolt throw and a good trigger, but if you can't aim the thing it doesn't really do you any good. So the last bit we have here is what they call the cytoscope. Uh, this is a periscopic sighting system. There is a mirror down here, and some mirrors up here. In fact you can see them right there. And uh, they experimented with a couple versions of this. Uh, some, including I believe this one, were one power without magnification, some were four power with magnification, and this is really a heavy duty chunk of iron. This is definitely an element of the design where they could have shed some weight had they uh, been given more development time to work on it. So to use this of course light comes in this main hole, and you'll note that the mirrors are slightly recessed. This won't produce any uh, lens uh, reflections like a typical scope would. That was something that Cameron and Yagi made a point of in their submission to the Ordnance Department. Anyway, light comes in there, travels down about a foot, and comes out this little hole. This is a threaded in eyepiece that we can actually take out. So. There's the, the actual hole that goes into the mirror, and you just look in this and you'll see whatever is uh, visible up there. Now in order to make this work you would have to zero this so that the crosshair in the mirror, you can see it right there, uh, will actually be where the bullet hits when you fire. And the adjustments on this are all external, they're all built into the mount. The windage adjustment on this isn't really quite fully functional, but the elevation one is in great shape considering how old this is. What we have is a spring here that's forcing, that wants this whole scope tube assembly to rotate. So threading this knob in and out is going to swing the whole scope forward and back, and thus change your elevation. 
You can't see a whole lot here, but you'll be able to see it when I mount this back on the rifle. We have a similar system up here for windage. However, there doesn't appear to be any good uh, like second spring putting continuous tension on this. So I can screw this one in a little bit and kind of push the scope. What this one does, you can see it's pushing off center here. It acts to rotate this whole assembly like this and thus change your windage. The scope attaches to the rifle using this uh, plate with a dovetail cut in it. This is the one modification that was made to the rifle. Now there are two stock reinforcing bolts right here on a standard 1903, and so Cameron and Yagi simply replace those with longer screws that allow them to mount this plate on. Then we have this dovetail mounting bracket uh, here on the scope body, and that is simply going to drop into that mounting bracket slide down, and gravity simply pulls that into place. It's a tapered dovetail, so uh, once it goes all the way down it's locked in place. There doesn't appear to be any solid, like, permanent mounting screw. This of course does make it very easy to take off, so that you don't damage it when you're not actually using it. This is again only a 1x periscope, so there's no magnification. Its purpose is simply to give you an aiming crosshair and to get you down below this line of sight, so that you can't be shot by whoever you're shooting at. Uh, so we can go down here and take a look at the sight picture you would actually get, like that. You can see the crosshairs there. If I zoom in we're going to lose the crosshairs, they're going to fuzz out. But there you can see that this isn't magnified, and uh, there you go. So what does this thing look like in actual use? Well, something like this and cycle the bolt, and aim and fire. And cycle the bolt again. I am not cycling it all the way open, because if I do that it will lock open, letting me know that the magazine is empty and I have to bring it down to reload. So from the back that looks something like this. I have to get my eye really close to this scope in order to uh, see through it effectively. Uh, you have a very small field of view through this thing. Uh, it would actually be really hard to look for targets through this, but it certainly beats sticking your head up there and getting shot at. Uh, I will add this, this whole contraption adds about six pounds to the weight of the gun, so that softens the recoil a bit. And interestingly, when you fire, apparently, when the rifle comes back, the, uh, the scope assembly down here is actually pushed forward because of pivot points and such, and so you don't actually have any danger of taking the scope in the eye, because it swings away from you, which is kind of nice. Anyway, um, from down here I can cycle the bolt quite easily, as you saw earlier. Aim, and if I can find a target, fire. Well, of all the trench rifles I've actually seen, I think this has to be about the most practical and best designed of the bunch. It really seems like it actually does exactly what it sets out to do, reliably and practically, and if a trench rifle is what you need, Cameron and Yagi came up with a pretty darn good solution. Unfortunately, a trench rifle wasn't really what anyone needed by late 1917 and early 1918, and so of course they were pretty much all destroyed. I believe there is one additional one, uh, or there was as of like the 1940s, there was one at uh, the Springfield Museum collection, maybe at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, and then there's this one. Um, this one originally came from the collection of Lieutenant Colonel William Brophy, uh, who wrote a number of very influential and respected books on American small arms. Uh, from there it then went into the collection of Bruce Campbell, who wrote a number of influential and well-respected books on American small arms, and now it's coming up for sale here at Rock Island. So if you would like to be the next person who has ownership of this really cool device, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to Rock Island's catalog page on it, where you can find their pictures and description and I believe some period photos of uh, these being shown and demonstrated in testing. And uh, well, you can place a bid over the phone or over the website or live in person at the auction if you're so inclined. Thanks for watching.